Sure. Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Mark Calabria. Mark is the Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute. Before joining Cato in 2009, he spent six years as a member of the senior professional staff of the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. In that position, Mark handled issues related to housing, mortgage finance, economics, banking, and insurance for ranking member Richard Shelby of Alabama. Prior to his service on Capitol Hill, Calabria served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Regulatory Affairs at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and also held a variety of positions at Harvard University's Joint Center for Housing Studies, the National Association of Home Builders, and the National Association of Realtors. Calabria has also been a research associate with the U.S. Census Bureau's Center for Economic Studies. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. Okay, like with all my guests, we are curious to find out, how did you get into finance and as well as Fed-related issues? So I would say mine was actually quite roundabout, uh, if you will. I, I at heart think of myself as actually an applied micro guy, so I appreciate okay. <laughs> being included in the, in the macro scope. Uh, and so my graduate work, for instance, was mostly in topics around information, around process. You know, you think about a lot of these moral hazard asymmetric information mm-hmm. questions. Uh, and in fact, to give you an example, my dissertation was on food and drug regulation. Hmm. So uh, I think about my career having moved from the study of toxic foods to the study of toxic assets. Very <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> um, and to some extent, there's the, the, a, very, a lot of the same models actually do apply. Um, and so, like many of us, uh, you know, I, I looked at teaching, uh, honestly didn't like a lot of the offers I got and ended up working for a couple of trade associations and ended up also being able to do a, a fellowship at Harvard's um, Joint Center for Housing Studies and got me really interested in mortgage markets, which are obviously uh, also uh, vulnerable to asymmetric information questions. And, and again, that's, that's sort of been a theme of my interest uh, in working on mortgage markets is actually what ended up getting me on the banking committee. I actually started my career doing a little bit less than a year for the end of Phil Graham's tenure as chair. Uh, And as you recall, uh, Graham was an economist, uh, still an economist as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so they brought me on to do mortgage issues and slowly started working my way into the rest of the issues uh, facing the committee. And and then when Graham retired, I ended up spending a year at HUD running their mortgage regulation area. Uh, Interestingly, for another economist, uh, John Weicker, who's a Chicago PhD from that golden era of the 60s, but uh, he was at the Hudson Institute now and, and really kind of got to banking via thinking about the transmission mechanism of monetary policy that is property markets, that is housing, that is mortgage markets. Uh, I think it was uh, Ed Lemer who said something along the lines of housing is the business cycle. Yep. Uh, and so to me, it really, it's hard to think about these markets for a long time without really thinking about monetary policy. Uh, and say as a side before working on the Hill, spent a little bit of time at a couple of trade associations in the real estate mm-hmm. industry and spent a little time there doing regional macro forecasting. So really uh, the exciting things of sitting around thinking about what housing starts in Des Moines were going to be next quarter. Uh, and it really did kind of get you thinking about how does the economy work and how does monetary policy feed into all this. Uh, so which got me to the committee and started working on monetary policy there. I was our only PhD on either side and got the opportunity to work on nominations. So for instance, worked on Bernanke's, not only his CEA nomination, but his hmm. first nomination uh, is Fed chairman. I also got to know other members of the Fed board that way and interact pretty regularly, um, despite uh, what my friends over the Joint Economic Committees do, which is very important. They're an oversight committee. Banking actually does most of the actual economic stuff in terms of legislation. So it was really a wonderful opportunity to kind of see economic policy making from the inside. And, and quite frankly, not what I thought I was going to do when I was in grad school, but it ended up being a lot of fun. Well, let's talk about your experience on the committee in the Senate. And let's go to the Fed hearings that you just alluded to. How did you prepare, maybe how did you prepare your senator for those hearings? Because often when you watch them, it, it seems, and maybe this is more on the House side, um, that the communication between the Fed chair and the congressman, congresswomen are often, they're, they're at different levels. They're, they're throwing the same things that they, they, they don't really speak to each other. So how did you prepare your, your senator? I think that's a very fair uh, 
observation. Uh, I may be a little biased in saying that I think the dialogue in the Senate hearings are, are slightly better, better okay. than they are in the House hearings. That's my impression, too. House hearings. Um, so in one way, I think it's gotten worse. In one way, I think it's gotten better. And, and I'll talk about my preparation in terms of going to that as well. So rarely do you have anybody, even in the Senate, where a member understands much about monetary policy. So first getting yourself to the point of being able to explain to them the pros and cons, uh, it really depends on the member. Unsurprisingly, the short time I worked for Phil Graham, you didn't prep him at all. You didn't write questions for him, you write statements for him. He knew what he was gonna ask. He had his own thoughts on monetary policy okay. and he asked them. Shelby was a much different animal in that, uh, you know, we would walk Shelby through, the, we'd write his opening statements, you'd write questions, you'd talk him through what the points were. Uh, he certainly wasn't gonna ask anything he wasn't comfortable with. Uh, but you tried to educate him on what the basic parameters were. You certainly were never going to be in a situation where you could get to very detailed questions. You know, I, I wasn't, Shelby wasn't going to ask what a, you know, how much you can rely on an expectations augmented Phillips curve. You know, you weren't <laughs> going to get those sort of questions. Okay. Um, unfortunately, one of the things I think has gotten, you know, well, one of the things that's been consistent, uh, but it's probably actually gotten better in some ways, particularly in the Greenspan era, this was such a media circus that the hearings mm. were always an opportunity for, especially in the House, for members to get their 30 seconds of, of national TV time. So you had a lot of discussions of things that weren't monetary. You go back 10 years and you watch these hearings and maybe a third of it was actually discussions of monetary. I think that's gotten better. I think the conversations have actually gotten uh, a little deeper from the members. Uh, I think you've seen a little bit more engagement. Um, again, I'd be the first to say, I think there's a lot talking past each other. Um, I think there's a lot of positioning. I think there's unfortunately a, not as much dialogue as you would like. Um, but we would look to a lot of outside sources. So for instance, um, the Congressional Research Service has a very fine macroeconomist who's still there, uh, who would come over and brief the committee and we would do hearings for the staff. You know, and we would walk them through kind of the you know, the dozen or so basic metrics of the macro economy you'd look at, and we talk about what the impact were. So we would get members and their staff up to speed so they weren't completely embarrassed to ask a question, mm -hmm. but very, very difficult. And unfortunately, I think it's fair to say, other than the twice a year Humphrey Hawkins, there really is very little engagement at a really in-depth level. I mean, yes, the Fed chair um, would normally have lunch or breakfast with members of the committees, but those conversations were rarely quite deep. Yes, I had Andy Levin on the show recently, and he proposed something that Scott Sumner has also proposed, and that is to have a quarterly report come out from the Fed that assesses what it has done recently and where it is going. Uh, he he also talked about having like an annual, each year annual goal, have quarterly reports kind of update what they've done, kind of give an accounting of you know, why they may have gotten close to their target, what they haven't. And I think that would be incredibly useful for these hearings, it's something that both sides could speak from. You know, um, the congressman, the senator could say, hey, what's happening? Your own report says you have deviated for these reasons. And then the Fed chair could respond to that as, as opposed to speaking past each other. I, I think that would be incredibly helpful. One of what I should say, the primary reason that I have been relatively sympathetic to proposals, the sort of GAO audit the Fed proposals, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not dismissive of the political concerns, but and, and I may be naively optimistic here, but I see it as at least an attempt to try to educate members of Congress. And we really do this in so many areas where, you know, and I, I know we may come to this later, but when I set along the path of trying to figure out what the right regulatory framework for Fannie and Freddie was, the first thing we did was ask GAO to do a number of reports and say, what can you tell us about what the literature says? You know, what's best practice? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think having that external voices, um, and again, GAO, any sort of report is going to be relatively bland and relatively uh, unbiased and will give you, you know, here's kind of what the consensus of the literature is. And so trying to get members and staff up to speed, uh, you certainly seen some improvement. Again, I'll emphasize I was the only uh, PhD on either side of the committee staff at the time. Uh, you didn't even have that on the House then, you do now. Uh, so there's been some improvement there and that's gone back and forth. I mean, you've certainly seen times where it's worked well and where it hasn't. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever get back to the era uh, you know, I, I think back, I guess this must have been 50s or 60s when Paul Douglas, of of course the Cobb Douglas mm -hmm. production function, chaired the monetary subcommittee. <laughs> you know, and you, you rarely get senators, right. of course, with, with their own production functions named after them, um, but also ones that can engage in, you know, you go back and you look at those hearings and you really had 
really good just conversations about monetary policy. Uh, I think it's tough to get there without getting members to that point. So more exposure, more uh, briefing, more background, um, I think that would help move the conversation because I, I do think you need to have a conversation right. that doesn't occur today. I, I think there needs to be some kind of benchmark against which Fed policy can be evaluated. And I know the Form Act has created a lot of controversy, a lot of pushback. In my own view, I don't think it is that onerous. I think, if anything, it's just purely a benchmark. If you look at the act closely, if you can get past some, your emotions and look at that closely, it says, you know, pick a rule, you choose it. And yes, if it's different than the Taylor rule, justify why. But, you know, the Fed would pick its own rule and it would give reports on why it deviated from that. But it's not a binding rule. It's, it's not a, a rule that's going to punish them. Um, but I, I think it'd be useful, something like the Form Act, maybe not the Form Act, but something like it, in the sense that there'd be a benchmark. Because it's kind of hard right now for a congressperson to, to evaluate the Fed if they don't even know what the Fed's own goals are. Now, the Fed has an inflation target. It has consistently undershot it. So it kind of creates this uncertainty. What are you trying to do? You, Trying to maximize employment? Are you trying to you know, price stability? It's it's very murky, very unclear. Something I've pushed for is I wish the Federal Reserve would release their own estimates of the natural or neutral interest rate because they often talk about it. Even now, um, this last week, uh, Stanley Fisher talked about rates are going to be lower permanently. There, maybe there's demographic reasons. And they talk about this natural rate, but they never tell us what they think it actually is. They, it's going to be low. Now, the, the board governors, the, uh, the uh, FOMC does release the projections, which show the long-run yes. estimate. But we don't know what their short-run, real-time estimates are. Janet Yellen had a speech in the last year where she, she had a chart that showed um, a range of estimates based on different models. And I know that the natural rate is uncertain. We don't know it perfectly. But something like that, that would give a ballpark where we think the neutral policy is, why we're there, why we're not there. Just as a starting point for conversation. I, I very much agree with that. And, and I think the Form Act has been misinterpreted in a lot of ways. And to some extent, what it is suggesting, um, because we know that for the most part, the Fed is running Taylor rules internally. So to some extent, the real substance of it is, why don't you share with us what you're already doing um, right. so that we can have a conversation about it to see whether it's effective or not. And of course, it's worth reminding you know people that to me, inheriting the Taylor rule is kind of this uh, – Keynesian output gap trade-off. So it's not as if you're asking for some sort of Friedman style rule. I mean, it's really not all that radical. It's what the Fed does today. You're really just asking them to tell you that. I'll note what I think uh, you know has been not really looked at in terms of what I think it ultimately be a very powerful um, but minor reform. In the Form Act suggests that like a lot of other agencies such as the SEC and the CFTC, that individual members of the Fed board get some of their own staff. And this is, I think, it, it just seems minor, but the fact that if you are a board member, the chair, all the staff report work for the chair, mm -hmm. you know, and that is the control of information. And I think this is particularly important um, as long as we're going to be in a world where the Fed does not only monetary policy, but also uh, regulatory policy. I mean, for instance, I don't think I'm disrespecting Dan Tarillo to suggest that his expertise is regulation, <laughs> not monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and again... You know, I think we saw this in the Greenspan years where he, quite frankly, for good or bad, took very little interest in the regulatory side. And I think that's true with Yellen. Uh, so to me, to have a situation where Dan Carrillo could have an economist that works for him or, um, you know, if you're another uh, lawyer, on the, or if you're an economist on the board, you might want a lawyer to work for you to tell you understand how, you know, the capital rules work. So I think that would actually help empower debate because right now the, the staff control, the resources are really controlled by the chair. And it's not the way that other agencies work. And this leads to groupthink and the possibility Absolutely. for bad decisions, which we'll get to later, some of the cognitive biases that we learned from behavioral economics. You have a paper in the Cato Journal and gave an, another version of that at a conference. And it's really interesting. We'll get to that in a bit. So we've been talking about the Fed. Um, we've segued into that from your experience in becoming a macroeconomist slash finance person. Yes, we will give you the, the, the title, <laughs> let you wear the hat that says macroeconomist on it during this interview at least. <laughs> I'm also curious about your time on the Senate Banking Committee during the crisis. So can you tell us about that experience, some of the things that had happened? That was a very intense time, oh, and you lived right through it, front lines. Tell us what it was like. For, let me first say, you know, I started on the committee in, in the summer of 2001 and, again, went to the administration for a year and was back by 2003. 
And there were a number of things early on that we had very strong concerns about. So I often hear in the popular press that nobody saw it coming. And of course, nobody saw exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, But many of us had a lot of strong concerns. You know, I had put together hearings on the housing market, you know, starting in 2005, where we were worried even before then uh, about imbalances that were there. Uh, we were certainly, most of my time, actually, in the committee was spent on reform of Fannie and Freddie, which we felt was not going to end well, and of course did not end well. <laughs> uh, you know, on some other issues, for instance, we, I worked on a credit rating agency bill in 2006, where we thought we needed to bring more competition to that market. Uh, I'd be the first to say it ended up being too little too late. But again, it was an issue of concern of how the rating of securitized mortgage-backed securities and other assets. Um, ABS were being rated uh, and trying to fix that market. So there were a number of things uh, that I think we got right in terms of we saw it put on our radar screen, but in many instances simply could not get, um, couldn't get 60 votes in the Senate for us. It's a short answer of it. Uh, And so there was certainly a frustration on my part in that 10 years ago, the broad sense in Congress was, you know, everything's fine. Uh, It certainly was very commonly heard that housing prices only go up and, you know, worst mm-hmm. case scenario, they would flatten down. So, you know, in a great, you remember this was the heart of the great moderation. And of course, it was not long after or during that time when, you know, Bernanke's famous speech to Friedman, you know, we, we won't do it again. So there really was this sense of complacency. Um, and so I feel a lot better, at least today, because I don't feel like when I raise issues of financial instability, I'm alone in the same, in the same way. Um, but that's pre-crisis. So getting to the crisis um, there really was, let, let me put this, the calls you would get from Treasury and the Fed were generally either, you know, minutes before they were going to do something or right after. So the decisions hmm. were certainly made. Um, and there really was not an interactive kind of, we're going to tell you what we're doing or we're going to seek input from Congress on this uh, up until they, up until the TARP. And of course, they had to come to Congress for that. So you would he- hear about these things you know, only a little bit before they'd hit the press. Um, the benefit, of course, was you, you'd, ha- you'd have them come up. And so uh, Scott Alvarez, who's the general counsel of the Fed, spent a lot of time coming up and walking us through why they did decision X, why they did decision Y. Uh, as much as I like Scott, I will say some of the justifications that I think I got at that term were not, to me, from a legally perspective, very compelling. Um, but you got a lot of real time, or at least after that time, analysis of why they made the choices they made. And I will say, unfortunately, I think a lot of it which is this is very difficult as sort of a falsifiable matter, almost always came back to fears of panic. Um, they were rarely about, you know, could we resolve these institutions in a manner where, you know, we could allocate losses correctly. Uh, they were rarely sort of questions about, you know, could we, you know, could we reorganize this? It really was how were markets react. Um, and it's very hard to kind of figure out whether that's right or wrong. Um, of course, there were frustrations. The other side, I often say, if you don't think you have a panic, then putting the president and the treasury secretary on TV and telling people you need Bill X by Monday will probably cause a panic. Mm-hmm. So there was this really kind of running around. Uh, there, and I think if you read some of the things, I, I actually think one of the best books during that time is Paulson's because it was written right after the crisis. He doesn't have any scores to settle. It, it conveys what I think I felt at the time, that fog of war. Um, and so there certainly was, you know, put out this fire, put out that fire. And it really wasn't until they got to the TARP. And even the TARP was not clearly thought of, as you know, it was first supposed to buy assets and then later was turned into equity injections. Um, so there was very little long-term thinking. The, mo- the most anybody was seeing was two weeks, in, two weeks in front of themselves of that. So wasn't there a meeting where they came in, Paulson and Bernanke came in and said, look, if you don't do the – was it TARP where they came in and yes. said, if you don't sign this bill by Monday – your debit card won't work, your bank account won't work? There was a lot of what I, you know, I don't think I would ungenerously call fear mongering. They're mm-hmm. really, we got that on the committee. We got, literally, I was told if we didn't do this, you couldn't go to your ATM and get cash out. Uh, and I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, I was uh, working on Capitol Hill on 9 11, and we know on 9 11, actual physical components of the payment system were destroyed. Uh, And despite that and despite the grounding of planes Mm -hmm. and the stopping of check transactions, you were able to cash checks and and the system largely worked. Um, So at some extent, um, I guess I put it this way, what we were being told felt like we were being sold a bag of goods without necessarily an explanation. And that was really one of the more frustrating parts is someone trying to play an oversight role on behalf of the public um, is you don't feel like you were getting the full story. 
Uh, and I understand. I mean, I think the perspective of the Fed was, you know, we're in the middle of this. You know, you don't stop a firefighter in the middle of a fire to tell you what he's going to do. You let him do it. That was the Fed's perspective. Uh, and I understand their logic to it. I disagree with some of the number of the decisions that were made. Uh, but there really was not as much dialogue as I think needed to happen. And there really was a sort of doomsday scenario regularly promised that if we didn't do X, really bad things would happen. Well, that only reinforced the fear, though. I, Absolutely. I mean, if, if, and the thing is, you know, I read about it, others read about it. It wasn't just you. So the fact that the media got a hold of it and spread it, maybe maybe it was being used to manipulate certain people on the Hill, but but – that's just generating, reinforcing the fear that's already out there. I, I think that's absolutely the case. And if you've, you know, Zingales had a piece a couple of years ago on the trust crisis where he tries to measure some of this trust impact. And I mean, I guess this is part of my inner Keynesian talking. I think confidence is important uh, and I think is certainly a contributor to macroeconomic stability and, and instability. Mm -hmm. But it also, it cuts both ways. I mean, you know, to me, you simply can't believe that the government can be a source, a strong source of confidence without believing the government can be a strong source of uh, undermining confidence. And I would say what we got during the crisis uh, was not a sense of strong hand at the wheel. It was a sense of panic. You know, so this reminds me of a, of a talk that um, Ben Bernanke gave soon after he became Fed chair and I think March 2006, where he's discussing the flattening of the yield curve. Yeah. And in that talk, he tries to explain away, you know, why the yield curve is flattening. So for our listeners who don't know, whenever the yield curve, the treasury yield curve, which shows the relationship between the, um, the maturity of a, a treasury security and the interest rates on them, whenever that yield curve flattens, or another way of saying that, whenever short-term rates start to go above uh, long-term rates, usually it has led to a recession. And so this was beginning to happen. And in 2006, it was evident. And so Bernanke in the speech said, don't worry about it. It's different this time. Yeah. And, and in theory, you could argue it was due to a change in the term premium. The, one, the, the, the traditional story is if short-term rates are going up or if long-term rates are going down, it must mean that it's, you know, the market expects a recession in the future because short-term rates are going down. He argued that wasn't what was happening. What, what was happening was the term premium. And, and there were some things that had happened, some accounting law changes and stuff that had occurred. But in retrospect, it was <laughs> the market yeah, I, was forward-looking and I, concerned. I think the market was certainly forward-looking. And you might remember earlier, uh, Burnett, um, Greenspan talked about it as the bond market conundrum. Yep. Uh, I actually think one of the small contributing factors to that in the mortgage side, because you do remember when rates started going up in mid-2004, the long-term rates in the mortgage market were, were quite sticky. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, during this period, and I don't think we fully r recognized this until later, um, that the channel of essentially global savings, and this is one of the things I think Bernanke gets partly right, the global savings, glo mm -hmm. setting aside, of course, that global savings nets to zero, but um, that money coming in from the rest of the world, much of it flowed through Fannie and Freddie, and they were buying long-dated assets. So this is not to disagree with the expectation part of the yield curve, but to also add in that, to me, I, I am a believer in that there are segmented markets along the yield curve, uh, in that the greater um, demand for assets at that end of the yield curve in the terms of mortgage-backed securities flowing through Fannie and Freddie, I think were one of the things that held down the long end of the curve. Well, I completely buy that. And that would be the, the term premium yeah, exactly. story. That, Agreed. that this inversion wasn't entirely the result of uh, weakening of, of, of economic forecasts, but it was part of the story. But but you can go look at people have studied, you know, they do decompositions, what part expectation, what part term premium. And the largest part is the expectations, right. although the term premium was going down. However, I guess the point in bringing this up, even if Bernanke did believe that it was due to a weakening of expectations. If the market, even if he thought the bond market was saying, "Look out ahead," he couldn't really say that. I mean, I guess just as, as a, an, maybe as the opposite side of what he said to you guys, <laughs> you know, the world's falling apart, and maybe you know that was an extreme case. But you know, what, what if he Bernanke had believed that the yield curve was saying recession? I mean, could someone in his position acknowledge that? It's a really good question. So I've actually had this conversation a number of times with friends of mine who worked at the board and, okay. you know, when they were there for the meetings. And, you know, they often say to me that, yeah, there's, there's, there's more of a recognition of the uncertainty and there is this concern of the Fed projecting confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, and again, if you might remember, McCain, remember in 2008, got all sorts of abuse for in the 
President Ture say that the fundamentals of the economy were fine. And of course, what he was trying to do was talk. I mean, to me, he was trying to do the public spirited thing of talk up the economy uh, to try to avoid a mm-hmm. recession. And I do think you're in this situation where, and it, and it gets a long term credibility issue. I don't think the Fed chair really can you know, there's a degree to which you're limited in how honest you can be. Uh, I think that that's true. Uh, you know, yeah. I, and I say that as somebody who's very frustrated with feeling like I'm not, I don't often get as much honesty from the Fed as I'd like. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a gamble and it, and it is a risky thing. Um, I think there was more, and again, we've seen this from some of the transcripts that have come out. So, of course, we didn't know these things at the time. Um, so, I think we know two things. On one hand, you know, other than, say, Susan, Susan B. And, and a few others, there really weren't all that much discussions at the board late into the game about an impending recession or problems in the housing market. So some of the public statements of Bernanke, such as saying that he thought, thought subprime would be contained, I think he thought that, and I think the evidence suggests that he, think, he thought that. There were other things that I think, to your point about, I think there were concerns about a slowing economy that were going on internally that were not spoken, and I do think there was this concern of if we voice that, it might become self-fulfilling. So it, it really is an expectations game, and that's certainly a very important part of it. Right. So we had on the show Roger Farmer, who talked about his approach to macro, and we talked about this earlier, and how animal spirits can definitely play a part. He, he considers you know, confidence a fundamental input to production, not just as much as technology and, and, and capital and labor is. So it's an interesting discussion. And, uh, and, and again, it must have been an interesting time to be uh, involved in the yeah, Senate yeah. Banking Committee during that, that period. Well, let's move on to an area where you're an expert and spent a lot of time, and that's with Fannie and Freddie. And maybe if you could give our listeners a quick history of it, what were the problems, and, and where do we stand now with Fannie and Freddie? So, sure. Uh, in Fannie Mae was created in the 30s to buy mortgages from, of, of course, commercial banks at that time to try to add liquidity to the market. Uh, it was initially created as a government agency, so basically what Ginnie Mae is now. Uh, it was later in the 60s uh, in order to move it off budget, privatized. Freddie was later created in 1970. Uh, and interestingly enough, when Freddie was created, uh, it was created to be the thrift, the savings and loan version of Fannie. Okay. So it only bought from the, from the thrifts and Fannie only bought from the commercial banks. Uh, different but fascinating, I think, topic for another day is that Freddie was initially part of the federal home loan bank system, which was initially created to be kind of a federal reserve for thrifts. Because, of course, then the Federal Reserve Crew is created, thrifts are not eligible, uh, and it, largely with the advanced business of the federal, home loan, uh, the federal Home Loan Banks, this is kind of like a discounting business of the Fed. Hmm. Um, that is all converged. Of course, Fannie and Freddie today will buy from thrifts, insurance companies, commercial banks, and a whole, and a whole list of uh, potential originators. And, of course, of course, emphasize they buy loans, they don't originate them, so you can't go get to more, Fannie and Freddie get a mortgage. They are currently, uh, or rather have since been of September 2008, what we call conservatorship. Uh, which is not quite a bankruptcy, but it's you know it's it's a bankruptcy light. There's no real reorganization. It's meant to be a holding tank. Uh, part of what I worked on in the committee was creating the structure for that. I'll say as a side, it didn't work out the way we had planned. Uh, you know, for reference, the longest bank conservatorship was like 18 months, and we've been Fannie Freddie conservatorship for about eight years, so much longer than was ever expected uh, or intended, for that matter. Uh, and so we began the reform efforts in 2003, and this is really not not because we didn't think there were problems at Freddie beforehand, but 2003 were when the accounting scandals at, at Freddie Mac began. Oh, yes. Uh, and you started to have this momentum for reform and an opportunity that wasn't there before. I mean, prior to that, I'll, I'll give him credit, then Congressman Richard Baker of Louisiana was essentially the only voice in Congress for – uh, we need to be concerned this is not going to end well. And of course, there are a few others like like uh, Congressman Leach from Iowa who were concerned as well. Uh, and there were also concerns. It's worth saying that Fannie failed in 2000, and, uh, 1981 and got essentially regulatory forbearance, uh, you know, got a tax. Got, you know, there were laws passed that basically give them some tax right back so to, to basically fill the hole. But they failed in 1981. So it wasn't, this is like the first time. Um, and Fannie, it is important to keep what Fannie and Freddie grew out of the ashes of the SNL crisis. So before the SNL crisis, their activities were rounding errors, literally low single digit market share. Uh, SNLs failed. Fannie and Freddie largely gathered that business uh, and became themselves essentially two very large SNLs. So a number of problems faced them. Very, very little capital. So, for instance, uh, one of their business lines was to guarantee mortgage backed securities they sold. By statute, their guarantee business was leveraged 200 to 1. Wow. So to me, if you want to think about, and, and I guess uh, four gentlemen at Stern have a book called Guaranteed to Fail, which is a great read, but, but it really was the case in that 
you know, to me, one of the fundamental debates about the financial crisis are these issues of liquidity versus solvency. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to me, they're, they're certainly very interrelated, but at Fannie and Freddie, I have no doubt in my mind, the primary drivers were simply no capital, e even in good times. Uh, so certainly for a number of months, Fannie and Freddie were solvent solely because deferred tax losses were being counted as capital. So you had a lot of game plan accounting wise. Uh, certainly Peter Wallace and others have talked about their housing goals. I think that's a part of it. I don't put as much emphasis on that as Peter does um, because again, I think just the massive amount of leverage. Fannie and Freddie would have failed from losses on their prime loans because they simply had no capital. Um, you had this ambiguous, you know, what we call the implied guarantee. I'll say as an mm -hmm. aside, I've always puzzled at that term. It seems like a contradiction in terms in some sense. Um, I should say there's never, even today, there's no statutory guarantee of Fannie and Freddie debt. Uh, in fact, what we thought we were doing uh, in the 2008 legislation was creating a framework where losses could be imposed on creditors and that we were trying to actually end too big to fail for Fannie and Freddie. Oh, clearly, we did not. Um, but part of the intention of the legislation was to be able to essentially turn debt holders into equity holders and to recapitalize. Um, we went through a lot of, uh, I mean, essentially what we did was marked up the Federal Deposit Insurance Act and said, what do you do that would work in a bank situation? What do you do in a non-bank situation? So for instance, we recognized uh, that unlike most bank failures where the FDIC finds someone else to buy the bank, that was never going to work with Fannie and Freddie. We were never going to be able to find someone to buy Fannie and Freddie. Uh, and I think that that's the case probably, you know, if, if Citibank were to fail today, the odds of finding someone to buy Citi are probably pretty low. So you need to find uh, essentially a bridge bank facility where, you know, the, the main operational things stay in place. Um, and this was actually one of the debates we had at the time of the TARP too of why aren't we looking at potentially doing debt to equity swaps? So one of the things that's talked about a lot today is the TLAC, the Total Lapse Absorbing Capital, um, which is supposed to be a fix to too big to fail. Uh, one of the things I point out in terms of my skepticism of that approach is at the time of the TARP, Citi had about $400 billion in long-term debt. You know, we could have filled the hole at Citi completely by turning debt holders into equity holders. Um, would that have caused problems? Might have, I mean, but I think it's a conversation we needed to have. Uh, it was a conversation we did have and made decisions on for Fannie and Freddie. Um, so certainly the implied guarantee, I think, caused a lot of distortions. Uh, certainly Fannie and Freddie, uh, because of that implied guarantee, they were the conduit toward which global savings flowed back into the U.S. market. I mean, essentially what they did was they, you know, they, they sold debt to China, they got the money back from China, and they bought subprime mortgage-backed securities with it held on their balance sheet, and they, they arbitraged that difference. Uh, and, and they had no capital behind it. So again, it was a recipe to end up poorly. So the implied guaranteed is what made it attractive to foreigners yeah. overseas. Absolutely. Uh, I, the, the Chinese central bank was not buying countrywide stock. <laughs> they were buying <laughs> so treasuries and agencies. Tell me about this story then. There was a, I believe it was a Bloomberg story that I saw back then that the government of China made a phone call to our treasury secretary about the time of this crisis and said, hey, we, th we, we bought this with the understanding this stuff was backed. Is that a true story? So it, there, is some, there is truth to that. And Paulson went to China there near after. And I mean, despite the fact, I'll say it's, it's a legal issue. Uh, it's actually a violation of the law for Paulson to have said that. It's a violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act. But of course, we don't we don't hold public officials accountable in, in that way, um, <laughs> <laughs> even though it's got kind of criminal penalties. Right. Um, so there were promises made, you know, and this is actually pretty interesting. If you go back and look at the legislative record uh, in the hearings we had, and I organized in, say, 2006 and 2007, the committee is debating this very point where we understand China has a lot of holdings. And you will mm -hmm. find statements of Shelby saying, that's tough, China. You will take losses if this goes poorly. Mm -hmm. That's the will of Congress. Uh, we can debate whether, uh, you know, foreign creditors should be favored creditors. As you know, in a bank, you know, the depositors are first in line. And, right. You know, so we, we make choices over where people stand in line. And, of course, things like auto bailouts, we sometimes unmake those choices. Um, but so Congress made a choice that foreign creditors, even official foreign creditors, would be treated as unsecured creditors and treated just like everybody else. And, of course, Treasury decided that their policy preferences were a little different than that. Uh, and so there were foreign policy considerations that came into place. But that's absolutely the case. And another story that I, that I haven't been able to verify but I believe is true from sources I've seen is that at one point Russia apparently reached out to China and suggested that they both dump their agency securities at the same time. Really? In an attempt to royal the U.S. housing market. Yeah. Uh, and China said no. But, of course, it's partly because, of course, if you were China and you held that much, <laughs> your holdings right, themselves right. are, are, are going to take a hit. So, you know, what is the quip about um, – 
you know, I borrow a hundred dollars from you, but you know, I, you hold me over a barrel. I borrow a million from you. I hold you over a barrel. China, we really, in some sense, had China over a barrel given the amount. Well, so of, Larry you know, Summers, I think, called it the financial balance of terror. Yes. I mean that. But you know, I mean, I, this is a frustrating question to me in terms of just the balance of powers and, and economic mm-hmm. policy in general. And that, so Congress very clearly made an affirmative decision that foreign official holder cre- creditors would not be treated, would not be favored. Uh, Treasury decided they weren't going to respect that. Um, there are very good reasons for, to not respect that, but the question is who's supposed to be the one to make that decision? Um, and one of the reasons I wrote the paper was to kind of flesh out some of these questions. And not only in the relevancy of Fannie and Freddie, but to also ask, because the Title II of Dodd-Frank, the Orderly Resolution Authority there, um, is mirrored in some ways on what was done for Fannie and Freddie and didn't work. And so some of my skepticism about Title II is, well, we kind of tried this. And to put it in perspective, Freddie is smaller than City and a lot less complex. So for instance, um, with Fannie and Freddie, mm-hmm. you don't need to worry about uh, ring fencing assets in London or anything like that. Uh, you have a lot. You don't have to worry about. Um, you've, you, we've all seen these organizational charts of City and other banks where there's all these just hundreds of right. subsidiaries. It's not that way with Fannie and Freddie. Uh, very simple corporate forms, and so to me, and not even runnable debt. All of their debt is long term. Uh, most of their debt is over five. About half of their five year duration. So I, I go through this in the paper. Is sort of like here are the common reasons we're told that we couldn't have done it this way and we don't have to do it this mm-hmm. way. And I walk through this and say, well, was this relevant in the Fannie and Freddie context? Uh, how would this matter in, a, say, a Citibank context? Uh, and so this is some of my skepticism that we've ended too big to fail because I don't think we've actually changed the dynamic in terms of the regulatory incentives. Especially if we still haven't solved the Fannie and yeah. Freddie problem. I mean, they're still, being, they're still in conservatorship. I mean, how many years later is this? Eight years eight, later? Eight, eight, eight years eight, eight, later. Eight years later. I, I guess I haven't following. I thought by now they, they'd sorted this out. I remember them talking about very little. Being breaking them into smaller entities maybe or, or. There's been a lot of proposals, but very little done, very little likely to happen. What do you see happening then, I guess, going forward for Fannie and Freddie? Well, you know, my, my quip sometimes is, and I said a number of years ago that I was fairly certain that this administration would hand them to the next administration in, in conservatorship. So my, my, my joke is that the next Clinton administration may hand them to the next Bush administration, <laughs> which, which at some point maybe President Chelsea will, will deal with them. But there really is not a tremendous amount of urgency um, okay. for policymakers to deal with it. And there's also a tremendous amount of disagreement. I mean, so you still have a number of Republicans – uh, who don't want to have the backstop, who don't want this sort of guarantee for the mortgage mm-hmm. market. I'll say as an aside, uh, you know, very important caveats, the home ownership rate today is about where it was in 1960 before Freddie was created and when Fannie was in single digits and, and largely mm-hmm. irrelevant player. Um, so the argument that you often hear that, you know, we would see reversals in home ownership just aren't borne out by the data. Uh, and interestingly enough, one of the arguments given for Fannie and Freddie is that they would help close the gap between uh, white and minority homeownership rates. Uh, but interestingly enough, if you chart out the market share of Fannie and Freddie and you chart out the racial homeownership gap, the racial homeownership gap increases with the market share of Fannie and Freddie. In fact, the difference between uh, black and white homeownership rate today is the largest it's been in 100 years. Hmm. So, you know, at some point – you know, you, you know the quip about, you know, you've got to break some eggs to make an omelet. Well, at some point, you have to ask, where's the omelet? And in terms of home ownership and housing policy, we've broken a lot of eggs, and, and we, we still don't save an omelet yet. How much to show for it? Wow, very sobering message on Fannie and Freddie. Well, let's move on to another area that you deal with in your job at, at Cato, and that's the Dodd-Frank Act. And this thing is a beast. I'm told there's very few people who actually have read it from you know, beginning to end. Um, do you know how many pages it is? It's 16 titles, and depending on the version you have, it may be 800. Or, or the, the 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 committee print I have is about 800, but there are versions. Of That's amazing. So it's hard to imagine that any senator or congressperson's ever gone through it. Um, but with that said. Give us an overview of what it was meant to do and, and what do we know about its success or lack of success so far? Sure. And that's right. And there were a number of uh, objectives. So uh, titles one and two are really the two big to fail titles. And title one, of course, is what sets up the Financial Stability Oversight Council, where 
Um, we identify institutions we think are systemically important, or personally, in my mind, mm -hmm. that's synonymous with too big to fail. Uh, and then we, we subject them to heightened prudential regulation. Uh, and of course, this allows that just to be expanded, not simply to banks, but also to non-banks. And so there's a couple of insurance companies. Uh, MetLife recently won a suit to get out of this, but mm -hmm. there are a couple of others like AIG Prudential that are still in. Title II is the orderly resolution. So again, so essentially receivership um, you know, for non-bank financials. Uh, and so that's those are the two big to fail components. Uh, there are other components, maybe the one most famous is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that's in mm -hmm. Title 10. Uh, you see titles dealing with derivatives. And so one of the things that doesn't get enough discussion is for the first time clearing houses will have could act, have access to the Federal Reserve discount window. So, and we, of course, we also expand federal deposit insurance permanently to fifty. Uh, so, there's a number of expansions of the safety net. Some explicit, some implicit, in fan, uh, within Dodd Frank. Um, there are some mergers of the agencies. So, for instance, the Office of Thrift Supervision was moved under the Office of Control of the Currency. Um, there are some changes to the Federal Reserve governance. So there's a hodgepodge of stuff, and there's things that people have probably heard of, like the conflict minerals components that have nothing to do with the crisis. In fact, it's fair to say that probably about half of Dodd Frank has nothing to do with the crisis. Uh, and then the other half's <laughs> relevance is debatable about how effective it would be. Yeah, so Larry Summers recently came out and said that you know the big banks are still leveraged as ever. They're still as risky as ever. So. On that count, it doesn't seem to be have, to have done much, or am I mistaken? You know, you're correct. You're correct. There are two elements to to Summers' argument. Uh, one of which I, I don't think he pushes as much as I have, which is a lot of the change in capital happened through the Basel process, which ran parallel to Dodd Frank. So we would have seen changes to capital regardless of whether Dodd Frank were passed. And more importantly, a lot of the changes in capital that makes it the where if, on the surface it looks like banks hold a lot more capital is simply because of the fact that they've shifted into more assets that have lower risk weights. So, you know, if it's a sovereign debt where the risk weight is zero and you shift a lot of assets into that, then you look like you've got a lot more capital, but you don't really. Uh, and so, again, I, I've actually written about this, that there's not a lot more capital in the system there was, despite the fact of the claims to that. Summers has written an interesting point in that um, he looks partly at the franchise value. So this is, I think, a really important case in that, um, you know, up until the savings and loan crisis, I would say, and I know you've had some great economic historians on, on the podcast in the past, and to me, one of the interesting facets of banking history in the U.S. is we basically created little monopolies often. And because we created little monopolies with very high franchise value, you incentivize the institutions to be risk averse. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I've given you a bank charter. I'm not going to let anybody in this little town where you're in compete with you. Mm -hmm. You have something of value. You have a very strong incentive not to screw that up. Uh, and so what we've seen, at least since the, the erosion of branch banking restrictions, which I think is – I think that competition is a great thing. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that we forgot that came out of that is – it eroded the franchise value of banks going into the crisis. And what Summers has argued about is that part of what Dodd-Frank did was erode the franchise value of banks, changing the incentive of banks away from holding even more capital. Because again, you know, you've got these heavy costs, you're not making a lot of money on it, why would you put more money into it? Mm. Uh, and I do worry that we're getting to a point, um, you know, I often describe banking uh, in the U.S. as the, the, the state largely creates a kind of pseudo-monopoly, and the debates are really about who gets the division of sort of monopoly rents. Um, Ian, partly, some of those monopoly rents are redistributed to preferred constituencies, but as importantly, we don't know the level of those monopoly rents ahead of time. So how, do, how does the industry ever credibly say to the government, uh, there's no more. There's not a lot more for you to extract, and once you've extracted all of that, uh, you end up with really big problems. And I, and I think fundamentally, the problem facing our, our financial system today is we have a combination of very rigorous competition, which is a good thing generally, mm -hmm. but however, combined with very extensive guarantees, so you don't get the normal control on risk taking mm -hmm. you would get because of that moral hazard. So it's one thing to have uh, deposit insurance and implied guarantees when you've got a little monopolies because the incentive to gamble is a lot less. Uh, and I don't think we've, um, I mean, I don't think we want to put the genie back in the bottle of uh, the benefits from competition. You know, Ross Levine and others have written tons of work on how much benefit we've gotten out of uh, the reduction, the, the increase in competition, in the banking system. And I think that those benefits have been very real. 
Um, so to me, I, I think our approach going forward has to be a rollback of some of the safety net guarantees because ultimately vigorous competition combined with extensive guarantees implies to me that those guarantees will someday be called upon. Okay, so one of the proposals to change Dodd-Frank Act is the Financial Choice Act. Um, and there's a number of, of things that it does here. I, I have a list of them, but what is your sense of the Financial Choice Act, and, and what 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 is it? What direction does it push the uh, the banking sector toward? Well, I would certainly have written a different um, okay. act. I think it's a move in the right direction. Um, the core of it is really to do this swap of more capital for less regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got a lot of compliance costs that I don't think fundamentally make the system safer. And as uh, Larry Summers has gotten to, they actually um, erode the franchise value of these institutions. Um, and so there's really strong incentive to, to not hold any capital. Uh, and so how do you change this where you reduce the moral hazard in the system and you try to better align incentives by having more capital on hand? Uh, and I think, again, I think this is the reason what we saw with Fannie and Freddie, but we also saw this with Citi and Bank of America and others where – during the crisis, they were essentially, for all intents and purposes, insolvent. Uh, and again, you see so little capital. And it's also meant to try to bring more transparency to it. One of the, I think, the, the real problems is, you know, when the layperson picks up the Wall Street Journal and it says Bank X has 8% tier one risk-weighted capital, the layperson thinks that means 8% capital, when the reality is it might be 2 or 3% <laughs> actual capital. Mm. Um, which again, so our, our, our banks are often leveraged 30 to 1. And how do you roll back that leverage and try to readjust the incentive of management not to gamble? Uh, and so uh, I do understand, I think Henserling, uh, Congressman Henserling, the author of Choice Act, gets this, which is if you don't combine some relief with increased capital, you're essentially going to make it impossible for banks to function. Uh, and so, you know, and this is really along the lines of some of what Amadi and others have argued about. You could have much higher capital. I'm certainly of the belief that if we didn't have the guarantees we have in place today, the market would force banks to hold more capital because obviously debt holders would charge mm -hmm. you higher. So it, in some sense, it's a Mendigliani Miller argument, um, but it really is an argument about let's put more capital in the system. Again, there are other things like CFP changes to the consumer right. agency, which I think are very laudable. Uh, I think the structure of that's very prog problematic, but you know it's probably a conversation for another day. Well, let me let me go back to the point you made because the name implies choice, the Financial Choice Act. So, I'm reading here an excerpt from an article that was on it. it. This the Financial Choice Act would allow the country's largest banks to exempt themselves from capital and liquidity requirements and other regulatory standards if they hold enough capital to maintain a leverage ratio of ten percent. So, it's a choice in the yeah. sense if you if you voluntarily opt into holding more capital. You you don't have to have all these regulatory burdens placed on you. Absolutely, and uh, it's it's referred to as an off ramp in the bill. Um, and there's also some elements. I mean, many of the elements of the consumer financial protection stuff that are changed are consistent with that choice of, you know, you get to choose the products you want rather than the products the government thinks you should be able to have. But a core component of the higher capital is the institutions being able to choose it themselves. You know, I think ultimately that was likely done for political reasons. If it was me, I would say, let's get rid of the regulatory relief and it'll make you hold higher capital. So I do worry about, okay. you know, that, it wouldn't be the way I would draft it, but I think it's a step in the right direction and is probably the best you're going to get in this political environment. I don't suspect it's going to be making any progress with the elections going. Or Well, my is understanding is uh, Henshrelin, um has some sense from leadership that they will give him fuller time in December for it. Obviously, oh, okay. obviously, the, there's no time to pass in the Senate. Uh, Henshrelin, assuming the Republicans keep the House, will have another two years as chair. So there is a degree to which they're explicitly trying to lay groundwork for next year. Uh, and to go back to my earlier comments about Fannie and Freddie, so we, initially, we finally passed Fannie and Freddie for him in 2008. We started in 2003. So, you know, it took us three Congress, five years, three Congresses. Um, these, th you know, I, I guess that's some dedication. Way, it makes looking like resubmissions to an article to a journal look easy. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. You have to have a long horizon. To... You have to. And sometimes these things do take a long time. I, I mean, that's why I guess having congressional staffers that stick around is important, even if someone loses a seat in, in Congress. Well, let's go back to the Federal Reserve and the time we have left. And I want to turn to an article you've written that came out in the Cato Journal, and you have another article that's similar coming out um, Journal of Macro right. at some point. But you 
you draw upon behavioral economics and look at cognitive biases and how this can influence um, po monetary policy making. And, and I really liked your presentation when I heard that at the conference because you made this point. In fact, the other two panelists, they were kind of skeptical of monetary policy rules. Even though this was a conference about monetary policy yeah. rules, they came up, went up there and said, ah, you know, principles are important, but we won't be too, too rigid with rules. And you argued that because of all these biases, we need rules. So can yep. you restate that argument and tell us why sure. it's important? And so I, I thought, in a way, the other panelists made the argument that we don't know enough to have rules, and I tried to make the argument that we don't know enough not to have rules. Yes. Uh, right. And so, you know, the way I, I think about it is, you know, let's say you even, we all start with some model of the economy, and you all start, you know, whether, whether you're going to follow it or not. And the question is really, if you think it's the right model, or you really want to be able to test the model, what are the likelihood that you'll deviate from your own model? Uh, and of course, you know, we know that um, individuals are the ones making monetary policy. We know there's actually group decision making, so the potential for group think. Uh, and so I really wanted to think through, and a lot of this I think happens to any of us who are economists, and we look at something in economic policy and say, well, well, it seems to me the answer should be X. Why aren't we doing that? And so I, a lot of my work over my career has been to think about process and to think about why we end up making decisions that don't seem optimal, um, both in government and private market to begin with. And so I really wanted to think through what are some of the biases that we might see for Federal Reserve policymakers. I'll note, it's not original with me. Uh, I think I've probably written more and more extensive papers on it. Uh, Bob Schiller, for instance, wrote a fascinating op-ed, uh, 2008, 2009, arguing that the Fed missed the crisis because of groupthink. Uh, Orphanides has written some things on why he thinks they've delayed liftoff, in his opinion, because of status mm -hmm. quo bias. Um, and uh, there have been a few other pieces here and there. And I tried to pull a lot of this together and really tried to get us thinking systematically about if you wanted to essentially think of yourself as you know Uly Ulysses and you wanted to sail through uh, and not get yourself in trouble, you would bound yourself with rules because you wouldn't want to get distracted by other things. Uh, and that really is kind of the, the underlying question. Uh, I in the, in the in the forthcoming paper, built a little bit out of a mathematical model based on some of the work that Ron Heiner here at George Mason has done over the years in terms of, you know, the lower your capacity um, for making good decisions or the higher likelihood that you'll make mistakes, uh, the more likely you should follow rules. So one way to think about this in a very simple way is um, most of us stop at red lights when we drive. There's a lot of times, particularly in the middle of the night, when there's probably nobody else coming the other direction. And you would argue it would be more efficient for you to simply drive through. Uh, there may be instances where, you know, you're wife is going into labor or you've, I don't know, shot yourself in the foot or something and you and you, you need to hurry to the hospital where you may actually break that rule. But by and large, stopping at the red light, whether somebody else is there or not, is a good rule and mm -hmm. generally efficient overall. And the question really is, is your own cognitive ability um, a risk that you will break from that rule and get yourself into more trouble? Uh, and again, it's a recognition that the errors uh, in decision making are on both sides. So, you know, often the argument for discretion is it will stop you from making good choices. And I, I agree. Discretion, if we have rules, it, you know, an all-knowing agent will do better under discretion. But the question is we don't have those kind of agents. And so some of the discussion in the paper is trying to look at, you know, at least kind of the circumstantial, the, 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 the record of conversations you see at the Fed and putting in the context of biases we think that might be out there. So one of the ones I think is interesting for, say, the crisis is that you think about yourself as a lender of last resort and you have a couple of institutions that come up to you and say, you know, we're experiencing liquidity problems. Well, how do you know whether those institutions are representative or not? Is it simply the institutions that are in trouble who were poorly managed that tell you they're having liquidity problems? Or are the liquidity problems they're talking about broadly representative of the entire system and you need broad liquidity provision or not? That's a really hard question to know. Uh, but I think trying to frame it that way um, and getting central bankers to think about how do I make sure the observations I see are far more representative. And so, in fact, I would say one of the arguments for having a regional system uh, is the economy in Cleveland is not the same as the economy in D.C. or the economy in California. In being able to gather those different sort of sources of information 
uh, so that you reduce that representativeness bias and get a little bit more, a um, little less groupthink, a little bit more observations that enter the picture. And of course, there's, to me, really big in, in macroeconomics is, is availability bias, which is yeah. um, we tend to uh, overestimate the probability of things that come quickly to mind. You know, I, I would go as far to say uh, probably the biggest availability bias in macroeconomics is the Great Depression. And if it's interesting, if you go back and you look at the press and conversations around probably almost every recession we've had since the Great Depression, somebody invokes the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. I and mean, even in 1987, the stock market, someone invoked the Great Depression in the press. So every time, um, it's hard for me to believe that there was a high probability of the Great Depression in happening any of those times. Mm-hmm. So how do we kind of de-bias ourselves in, in that way so that we don't fall into this trap? And of course, it cuts the other way too. Many of us will talk about the great inflation of the 70s. So this isn't simply a, you know, uh, the other guy is wrong. And so I do think that behavioral economics is still at an early point. I do worry that some of it comes across as just so stories. Um, But some of there's some good work being done. So, for instance, there's work being done looking across corporate boards because, of course, there's a lot of data there across corporate boards. And we can come up with proxies for group things such as cohesiveness of the group and overlap Mm -hmm. of members. And so some of the empirical studies suggest that these are very real impacts. And so what I'm trying to do in this paper is really try to set up a framework for thinking about decision making at the Fed and potentials for cognitive biases and potentials to offset those. And again, one of those that I suggest is having a sort of rule-based policy um, so that we can try to figure out you know, the impact of those biases and reduce the temptation. I actually think when you hear opposition, informed opposition to the Form Act, which we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. uh, which again ca- requires the Fed to put out a rule but allows the Fed to deviate from the rule. Now, the bill is pretty clear that there's very little penalty to deviate. You, you got to come up and explain it, which at the end of the day is not all that much of an onerous right. burden. Um, what I think the proponents of that are actually reading into this are very strong status quo bias. I think what they're saying implicitly is that to put this rule out there that the Fed can deviate from will be very difficult psychologically for the Fed because there will be a strong status quo bias to go by the rule. Um, and that's the criticism. Of course, to me, that's the benefit of it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we could have an argument for how much debate you want to be able to have and how much flexibility. Um, I also think just even if you have a rule that we know is going to be imperfect, it allows market participants to make predictable decisions around those rules. So again, a lot of what I've tried to do, which I, interestingly has been, I think, a consistent approach of mine over the years, is, is just to ask, you know, why are we making the decisions we're making? It? And, and, and given that we probably don't know what we think we need to know, uh, given the ignorance that is there, given the cognitive biases that are there, uh, I should l- lastly say, um, despite all of that, uh, I do think there's a very useful role for you know rational expectation type models. And I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm one of these people that are quite eclectic in terms of let's look at the methodology at hand and figure out what we can learn from the situation. Uh, So I'm not as dismissive of, you know, we should certainly be starting, our starting point should be not to assume a lot of biases uh, unless we can't explain what we're seeing, but then to start look at biases to try to think about why what we're seeing doesn't match what we would hope to see or think we should see. Well, I think it's very interesting and and, uh, it's another Way for me to make sense of the world as I see it. And that's the I intention. mean, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a bias of my own. I'm, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll invoke the biases to justify my bias. But two examples, um, you know, th- there's been this fear since 2009, two, late 2000, when the Fed did QE, the massive inflation. Oh, yeah. I mean, massive, and that that speaks to the to me the availability bias. Absolutely. Because a lot of these people are older. They're looking back to the 1970s. And that's the first thing that comes to mind. Ah, you know, so. And, and as a, I think as a result, it's, it's one of the key reasons that the Fed has undershot its, its inflation target. I think there's this political economy pressure to be careful. And I think it, it leads you almost to the interesting argument that you want to make sure you have a board that has people from different cohorts and generations. Because, I mean, it, it, we're, all, we're all influenced by the time in which we went Absolutely. to grad school. Um, you know, I'll go back and mention that. Uh, so about half of the time I was on banking committee, the senior Democrat there was former Senator Paul Sarbanes of Maryland. Uh, He was a lawyer, but uh, he was also very, at the beginning of his career, a staff assistant to Walter Heller on the CEA. And you could tell in conversations with him and listen to him, he learned a lot of economics in about a two-year window in the 60s, and that's all he ever learned and stuck with him. And the fact is, some of it was right, some of it was wrong. 
and it is interesting. I think we could, if we could find a way to kind of have staggered, you know, cohorts of of people on the yep. Fed to bring those different things to well, bear. Well, that's a, that's a nice segue. The last part we'll, we'll do in our conversation due to time, and that is to a piece you've written called "The Fed's Diversity Problem." So, right there, that their whole generational issue might be one manifestation of this problem. Um, but you you talk about this, and you talk about how there's a lack of diversity on the board. So to speak to some of some of these issues. I mean, I'll, I'll let me start you off. Did some striking things in that in that paper of yours. One was geography. Eighty percent of the Fed governors come from the East Coast. Um, that, that was yeah, very surprising wow. to me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> to very true. very surprising. Now, is, is that just chance, or maybe it's a revolving door issue? Or may, you, later you, you you point to there's a certain number of schools um, that produce them. But so, what is your story for that? So we'll, get, we'll come back to this, this schools in a bit because I think that's more impactful for the economists. So okay. you know we should remember that up until uh, the Kennedy administration, it was unusual to have PhDs actually on the board itself. Uh, oh, okay. And this is a modern phenomenon, so it wouldn't have been captured in that. Uh, and so, it, of course, I also mentioned you know, Section 10 of the Federal Reserve Act says you can't have any one governor from the same district. And, of course, there have been problems with that over the years. Uh, Ian, you know, I'm trying to remember there was a Nathan Sheets, and uh, I forget the co-author, had a fascinating paper several years ago where they found that even board governors – their votes were influenced by the macroeconomic conditions of the districts that they came from. So this is not simply hmm. about the presidents, but also the board members. Uh, and so you are getting this narrowing of where, and mm -hmm. again, this is partly representative bias, but it's also partly where your networks are. But I also think because it's gotten to be more political in terms of who we choose people from the board, it's highly unlikely that you're going to end up on the Federal Reserve Board today if you haven't spent some time in Washington. You haven't been appointed to something, mm -hmm. uh, even if, you know, you, at least you would have traveled through CEA, you know, the Council of mm -hmm. Advisors at some point. So I do think we're limiting it to a narrower range of people within political networks, which predominantly ends up being Washington, New York, Boston. Uh, and so I don't think it's been – it's not some grand conspiracy. It's right. not, you know, how do we make sure that Wall Street takes over. It just happens to be that these are the circle of people you travel through uh, and, the, and, the, and the networks that they build. Uh, which I think is quite different than how it used to be at the Fed. So I, if that's a concern of mine, uh, I do think it ends up reflecting the economic conditions more of the East Coast. Uh, the fact is that you know, the only member of the board today that is from west of the Mississippi is Janet Yellen, and, and, and Berkeley probably has more in common with, with <laughs> Boston and New York than it well, does with much of the rest of the country. I remember when Ben Bernanke was appointed, it was claimed that he came from – Georgia or he was, South so he, Carolina? So he, he was appointed from the Richmond District, and oh. South Carolina is in the Richmond District. Because he grew up there. Yeah. So – and this is a good question. So the only thing the act says is you can't have two people from the same district. It doesn't actually define what any of that means. And so one of the proposals I've put out is let's put a 10-year – doesn't even need to be consecutive. You have to have lived in that district for some point. And even to Bernanke's credit um, – he did go back regularly to South Carolina. He talked to people there. He had relations there. So you knew that some of the conversations he would have in his life were reflective of that. Okay. Um, I, it, to me, and again, I, it's not um, – I'm not trying to pick on anybody. To me, it finally reached the, the ultimate absurdity with, with Peter Diamond's nomination where the White House claimed – that despite living his entire life in greater Boston, he was actually from Chicago because he'd once given a lecture at Northwestern. And, you know, it wow, wasn't even like, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. no, um, a, That is absurd, yes. yeah. So at some point, they've just read that out of the act. But I think that's an important part of the act. There's another thing I'll mention that's in, that's in the Federal Reserve Act, which is this might uh, come as a shock to some of our listeners. Um, there's no explicit mention of academia, whereas Section 10 of the Federal Reserve Act says the president must give due consideration to um, agriculture and commerce. And so the Federal Reserve was very explicitly set up not to be a board of academic economists. It was set up to be a board mostly of people in various lines of industry. Uh, and so while I am sympathetic to some of the concerns of capture from the financial services industry, one of my proposals has been that no more than two board members should be from a certain category. One of those categories would be academia, but another mm -hmm. one would be industry commerce, so that we really get people with different life experiences. Um, so I understand the calls for diversity from Senator Warren and others, and, and I don't think those are unimportant because I think they're trying to get at what I'm trying to get at, which is that we have – 
a different set of perspectives and experiences on the board. Some of those have to be geographic because we are not one mm -hmm. economy. Um, some of this have to be, uh, and, and, I, and I'm sure you run into this on a daily basis, that you know, I often say that uh, I learned more economics in the classes I taught than the classes I took. Uh, and I learn as much economics trying to explain it to somebody else because it forces you to think about this. And while this is important for the Fed board is that if you're an economist on the Fed and you're trying to explain it to other board members who aren't economists, and you're trying to essentially get them to your point of view, you really have to sharpen it. You really have to kind of get to the essence of it in a way um, that a lot of economists just start from a set of assumptions. So I think having that more of that dialogue, and I actually think it helps the Fed explain their decision making to the broader public. You know, if you are the Fed chair and you're used to spending your time talking to the board economists, talking to other economists and going to economic meetings and talking to economists, you lose your ability somewhat to clearly talk to the public. You're in a bubble. Yeah. And so this is ultimately a lot of my suggestions mm -hmm. are how do we eliminate the group thinks that's there? How do we break the bubble open a little bit? And I talk about some of the literature that's been done, you know, and there really are a set of um, characteristics and conditions of groups that have historically been found to lead to groupthink in bad situations. And, and some of the papers asking, um, do those situations and characteristics look applicable to the Fed? And of course, my argument is yes to many for, for many of them. So I think there are very legitimate reasons that if we think groupthink is real, we should think that uh, the Fed is susceptible to it. And we should think hard about ways to try to offset that diversity and rules being two such ways. Very interesting. We will have these papers put up uh on the uh, page where the podcast is listed. Well, we are out of time. Our guest today has been Mark Calibria. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Really been my pleasure. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.